Well, I'm back and it's fucking cold. That's all I can say. Uh, I guess there's global warming is a myth. Oh, it's like, what the hell is it? It's like 30 degrees out here. It's vacillating between uh, rain, sleet, and snow. And it's miserable, but that's beside the point. Um, I'm not too bad today. You know, a couple people have reached out and I appreciate that. It's been a fucked up situation. But I got a hold of the insurance company with this medical shit and got assigned a new doctor, which I will see in December. Um, that's the earliest I could get in. But tired of dealing with crap and tired of dealing with bullshit. And uh, like yes, I, yesterday, I had to take the dog back to the vet because the incision on her back split open. So yeah, it ain't really been a lot of fucking fun here. But again, I appreciate people who were concerned and reached out and uh, you know wanted to see how I was doing. Um, doing better, thank you. But I don't even know what fucking movie we're on. Is it the 18th today? Yeah, I guess so. 18th? No, I don't know. What is it? 7? 20? Whatever. Um, I can't keep track of the fucking movies. So, basically, the last Halloween movie I watched uh, the other night was Last Man on Earth with Vincent Price. Um, unfortunately, that film had fallen into public domain and was, like, so many shitty copies of it were floating around, and then um, I think Legend picked it up, and Legend picked up a bunch of stuff, and they colorized it, but these were the same people that were colorizing the Ray Harryhausen film, so it sort of looked pretty cool. It looks a lot better, and I think somebody actually uh, did a restoration of a Blu-ray. I don't know which company did that, but it's obviously out, and... It's probably one of the most faithful adaptations of Richard Matheson's I Am a Legend, or I, I Am Legend. Um, you know, it's been kicked around before the Omega Man and then the Will Smith big, big budget extravaganza. But the whole thing with this one is it, it's just weird and creepy and has that, you know, atmosphere of impending doom. And, of course, you know, Vincent Price is great in it. And, you know, the, just the whole bleakness of the scenery, you know, the the dead bodies of the, the vampires that you find when you wake up and stuff, and then Vinny making stakes and just spending the day driving them through uh, the vampires' hearts until it comes to uh, pass that um, might be killing the wrong people. There actually are, you know, some people that survive and, you know, deal with certain shit. So all in all, it was definitely worth a second look. But I had to segue into something else because I get, you know, I got a little burnt out with, you know, a constant, you know, feat of horror. So I had picked this up here from 19, I believe, 1963, 1964, maybe. Let me double check that. 1963, The Girl Hunters with Mike Hammer, the creation of Mickey Spillane, the writer, who basically, who better to play Mike Hammer? Mickey Spillane who played it in The Girl Hunters. Actually, the weird part about this was, it was filmed in England. And, you know, it, you know basically, um, Spillane, you know, played Mike Hammer. Mike Hammer had been played before, uh, early in 1955, in Kiss Me Deadly by Ralph Meeker, who had two starring roles that year, that in The Big House USA. And Ralph uh, was cast as Mike Hammer in Kiss Me Deadly, and it also had his heavies, the two Jacks, Jack Lambert and uh, Jack Elam. So that was a cool one. But this one here is, you know, pretty fucking violent. It, you know, it, it, it's about his secretary who disappears and it winds up that she was a double agent during the war. And they send this guy, the dragon, to kill a bunch of people. And Lloyd Nolan is an investigator. And the fight scene actually looks pretty fucking real because it's kind of awkward the way a real fight scene would have played out. But, you know, here's Spillane slugging it out with the dragon, and when he finally knocks the guy unconscious, he nails the guy's hand to the floor with a spike and then calls the agent, played by Lloyd Nolan, who says, I, I got the dragon for you, and he ain't going nowhere. So that was interesting. Spillane was an interesting guy. He, he wrote a bunch of scripts for Hollywood, and he says, you know, he was out there, and they brought him out to, you know, write this thing. He wrote it, and then went back, and they had to get him, and then he agreed to play it, and he said, you know, they sort of thought his name would be a draw, but he says you know, they were basically cheap and didn't shoot it in color, and he goes, you know, we were up against, you know, Dr. No that year that was shot in color, so... Interesting guy. He sat there and explained the whole reason that the 45 automatic was invented. 
and that was because of uh, the Philippine insurrection with the Moros, that this tribe or a bunch of people that used to like load themselves up on cocaine and shit, and basically uh, the service revolver back then was a 38. The 38 basically didn't stop them. They just would get hit and hit and keep on coming and then dice up, you know, the poor guys with a machete. So they come up with the 45 not only because of its stopping power, because it would basically throw these guys back. So Spillane explained that too. Actually, Spillane and John Wayne were big friends. Um, Spillane was actually writing a treatment for John Wayne before he passed away uh, about, you know, the sheriff, uh, Caleb York, and that was supposed to be a go. Um, Spillane also has a protege, Max Allen Collins, who's, you know, picked up uh, the Mike Hammer stuff and has done a lot of, you know, unfinished manuscripts that Mickey had left uh, laying around. Um, but, yeah, they were definitely going to do a vehicle for John Wayne, and, you know, John Wayne had directed the Alamo and invited Mickey to see it, and after it was shown, he asked Mickey, he goes, what did you think? How do you think I did? And he looked at John Wayne, and he goes, there's no way the American public is going to pay $3 to see a bunch of Mexicans kill John Wayne. And he was right. The film tanked. I don't think Wayne directed another film after that, but... Um, he stayed friends with Spillane up until Mickey, Mickey passed away, and like I said, Max Allen Collins has picked up the torch and was basically uh, gifted a lot of Mickey's unfinished uh, manuscripts. And, um, you know, they've been co coming out here and there. I've been reading them. They're, they're a great read. You know, it's a, almost like a reader's noir, like film noir, where it takes you back to the 40s and, you know, the gum shoes and that type of language, but it, it's really pretty cool. Well, being that I got on that whole gumshoe detective thing, I had to pick up this. Uh, Robert Mitchum as Philip Marlowe here um, in the Raymond Chandler. You know, Raymond Chandler creation was the detective, Philip Marlowe. And this is a double feature, Farewell, My Lovely, and The Big Sleep. Farewell, My Lovely was shot in that time period. Um, great cast. Um, John Ireland, Harry Dean Stanton, uh, a very young Sylvester Stallone brought in by Joe Spinell, who was basically, Stallone was sort of Joe's protege, and Joe really believed in him. But Stallone's people convinced say, Sly to stay away from Joe and sort of fucked him in the end, which Joe, Joe never got over. He just really felt he was, he was screwed over by Sly, which he was. And um, who else was in that thing? Charlotte Rampling who looked great, and, um, you know, this big guy, I can't, what the, was this guy's name, he played, it was Moose Malloy, there's always a Moose Malloy, and I'm trying to think what the guy's name was, and I can't, um, can't see it here, Anthony Zerby was in it too, but a lot of shoot 'em ups a lot of great shit in there, and like Mitchum, it was, it was a role Taylor made for Mitchum, Mitchum just, you know, Sleepy idly sleepwalks his way through this whole thing, you know, and there's a whole bunch of crazy stuff going on. Uh, Bertram Gilliam is one of the thugs in there, too. So that's a good one. Uh, the other one, The Big Sleep, was shot over in England by Michael Winner. And this one starred James Stewart, uh, Candy Clark, who gets naked a lot and acts like uh, a psycho chick. Actually, Candy used to live in Montclair, New Jersey, and used to come into uh, the Chiller store a lot, and used to do the Chiller conventions a lot. I'm trying to think who else is in there. Uh, Sarah Miles, I said Jimmy Stewart. Um, Richard Boone as Lash Camino, what a great name for a heavy. And Oliver Reed as Eddie Mars, and the backstory with Oliver Reed was that he actually took a pay cut because he basically wanted to work with Mitchum. And um, now here you go, you got Mitchum who's a drinker, Boone who's a drinker, and Reed who's a drinker, and I wonder what happened behind the scenes with that. But you had, um, basically when they had their shootout at the end, uh, you know, Boone and Mitchum, the, the Michael Winter in his book said they were both shit-faced drunk and having a good time, and they just had to cut the thing to have it make a lot of sense. So, uh, yeah, a little uh, film noir with a twist in it, and you know, like I said, the, I, lo I love these two movies, and I love Mitch. Mitch was a great actor. Um, so that's what we got today as far as film goes. Uh, somebody brought up something really fucking strange about collectibles and is porn collectible. Well, I'd have to say yeah, because I never really collected. I mean, let's face it. 
we're all guys, except for, you know, our female viewers here, and what guy didn't have a little porn stash, his own private jerk-off stash somewhere? But some guys took it a step further. Um, I remember I was introduced to this older gentleman in Montclair, who I'm sure is no longer alive, who had a mansion full of porn. He had films that were shot basically through keyholes at one point. He had a huge, huge collection and bought a lot of stuff off me. Um, another one was a friend of mine who was a regular customer who basically, um, something happened, they pulled the eminent domain on his house and he had to get out, but his house was basically falling down around him. And I took three van loads of smut out of his house and sold it on eBay for some good money and people paid, you know, some good money for this stuff. So, um, yeah, they're, they're, it's collectible. I mean, up, up until a certain point, you know, eBay, you know, eBay was loaded with adults only stuff that was completely collectible, but then they made the corporate decision and no more smut. Um, another funny story was when I had my flea market in Rockaway, you know, I had my back room. And one night, this very matronly older woman walked in, and she goes, can I speak to you outside for a moment? And I'm like, yeah, okay, I don't, you know, what, what the hell's going on? So I, as I was walking out, she goes, you might want to get a gurney or a shopping cart. So I'm like, okay, what the hell? So she goes, my husband passed away, and I found his secret stash. She had a station wagon full of porn, and this guy was into big kits. We had books, we had VHS, we had DVDs, we had movies, we had basically a whole gurney full of stuff, and I said, well, what do you want for it? She goes, would you give me 50 bucks for it? And I'm sure, because I'm going to make a ton of money doing this stuff. But, you know, here, here it is, you know, another strange thing is like, you know, I go to come estate sales up here and stuff, and I sort of mention what I'm looking for, and they sort of shy away. But I'm thinking, how many collections were unknown to the spouses of people? And when they pass away, they find the secret stash, and they're fucking horrified. And how much of this shit has wound up in a landfill over the years? Which is sad, but, you know, some of it is collectible, and some of it, you know, like I said, a lot of people give me props for, you know, restoring a lot of it on DVD and stuff. But, yeah, that's what I do. So, you know, it is all collectible, and uh, unfortunately, um, those sources are drying up. So that's our show for today. Again, my thanks for people who were inquiring about me. I'm trying to do better and trying to feel better and trying to get my act together. So that's all I can do. So until next time, stay safe. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll catch you on the flip side.